Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Travis McPeak, and this is my good friend, Will Bengtson. And we're going to be discussing today monitoring anomalous application behavior in AWS. But first, let's talk about last holiday season when I was hanging out with my nephew, and we were watching the Polar Express. And I thought, why is this movie so creepy? Like, what's wrong with it? And I went online, and it turns out I'm not the only one. They summed it up very nicely in the Spilled Beans blog. Why is the animation from Polar Express so creepy? It turns out that the reason is because of an effect uh, known as the Uncanny Valley. Uncanny Valley means this. There's something wrong with the animation that they tried to make human. And if I were to push you hard to say what specifically is wrong with it, you could maybe tell me one or two things. But your brain knows that there's a lot of things wrong with it because we are very good. We have this innate, built-in understanding of what a human face should look like. And we can tell that, uh, when things are off from that. And the reason that we can do this so well is because we have a baseline. From the time that we grew up, we know what a human face is supposed to look like. And so this, this was from a, an interesting study where researchers took 16 participants. And they did before and after pictures. The before is just the normal participant. And the after was when they injected, uh, the, the researchers injected the participant with something that would make them a little bit sick. And they took pictures a couple hours after when they, when they were a little bit sick and presented them to untrained observers. And what was interesting is that the observers uh, were able to tell with greater than guessing average for 13 out of the 16 participants which was the sick one. So show of hands, who thinks that A is sick? OK, B? Interesting. The room also uh, guessed correctly, A is the sick one. And so again, the reason that we're able to do this very well is because we have this, from the time we grew up, this is what a human face is supposed to look like, and then we can see something's a little bit off. Um, and in particular, for, for this picture, something's a little bit off from the baseline, the normal. But of course, we're not here today to discuss human anomaly detection. We want to get really good at figuring out when something's wrong with our applications. And the good news is that we can use this same baseline approach And we can understand what is normal for our applications. And once we get to that state, we can spot unusual behavior. Something's off in the same way that we did, uh, or the researchers did with uh, the human participants. And we can do it quickly. Uh, an application all of a sudden does something that it doesn't normally do. That's unusual. We can do something about that. And the good news is that you can get started doing this today with simple and open source automation that we're going to be introducing. So the flow of this talk, we're going to discuss a little bit why this is important. <clears throat> and what do we need to build it? What are the prerequisites? And then I'm going to hand it over to Will. He's going to say how it works, discuss the approach. And then, of course, everybody likes less talk, more code. Breaches. Everybody, uh, I think, would agree with me. Thumbs down, right? Nobody wants a breach. There was a really interesting study, uh, the Ponymon Institute Cost of a Data Breach Report. And in 2019, they had very interesting figures. 29.6% chance of a breach in a given organization sometime in the next two years. So look around the room. More than one and a quarter of you is going to experience a breach in your organization in the relatively near future. So this is something that we should definitely be thinking about today. You don't want to start thinking about it when you need to. We should prepare and plan for this. Now, on average, it takes 206 days to spot a breach. Um, and I think that it, it's pretty intuitive. Most of us would agree that if you can spot it quicker, then everything's going to be better. The cost is going to be much lower. Uh, you have less time to respond. You can contain the damage, You know, a bunch of reasons. In the report, they further elaborated that if you can discover a breach quickly, it's 37% cheaper. So the way that this worked is they divided all of the breaches in the study into two groups, less than 200 days and more than 200 days. And they found that, on average, the less than 200 days group was 37% cheaper. 
So this means that if we get really good at detecting things like breaches early, then we can make a material impact in how bad it's going to be. You know, best case scenario, we can completely prevent it. We can contain any damage. Zero dollar cost. That would be awesome. But generally speaking, the quicker, the better. Now, this is uh, real, something really interesting, and it, it's from the, um, the target breach. At the time, target was the second biggest data breach in, um, that had ever happened. This was 2013. It has, of course, today been eclipsed by much bigger data breaches that we all hear about and live with on a daily basis. But for its time, this was huge. For those that aren't familiar, the way that it works is this. Attackers uh, compromise uh, a third party that Target was using, that it had partnered with, and used that elevated privilege to get into Target's network and start installing malware on point of sale systems. And the idea of installing the malware was that they're going to collect credit cards. And, and so on November 27th, attackers actually began to collect credit card data from the malware that they'd installed on the point of sale systems. So this is when this is when the bad stuff starts happening. And then three days later, the point of sale system malware was completely installed, and the attackers moved to installing exfiltration malware. So this is, this is how they're actually going to get the credit cards out of the environment. And at this point, something that's pretty interesting is that the Symantec and FireEye, which are two security companies that the Target had bought, uh, actually had triggered alerts. So this was the first opportunity that the Target security team had to, to do something, to prevent the breach, to quarantine, or whatever. Now, three days after that, on December, on December 2nd, the attackers actually began to move the data out of the environment. So that three-day window, November 30th to December 2nd, the credit cards hadn't left. And the security team, if they had paid attention to the alerts that they were getting, could have done something. They could have prevented the breach. And you know, the, the estimates for this are $250 million, I think, was the, the most recent one I've seen in impact. So it, the, the point of this is that it's really important to get, to get good at spotting these things quickly and then doing something about it effectively. So I would like you to imagine that you're on a security team for a company that uses AWS. And you have an application, and it's public facing. It's a web application. It's part of your business. And then somewhere else in the environment, you have something sensitive, something you want to protect. And I think all of us would like to believe that, OK, the web application is never going to get compromised, but we all know that that's not true. As much as work as we do as a security team and developers do, at some point there's going to be a compromise. It's just the nature of security vulnerabilities. You can't have applications that don't have any bugs, and some classes of bugs are security vulnerabilities. So the, the application will probably get compromised at some point. And the attackers are going to take their point of presence on the app and try to pivot over to the sensitive data in the environment. And in order to do this, they're probably going to start with a little bit of reconnaissance. They'll start scanning the network. You know, what, what can I access from this system? They might run some AWS API calls, like get caller identity, which is the, uh, the AWS equivalent of Linux's Who Am I? They might call S3 list buckets to see can I list buckets, and what are those buckets? Now, the good news for us is that with the approach that we're talking about today, we have an advantage here. The attacker has to know what the normal behavior for the application is. Because if they, if they call something that the app hadn't called before, we're going to get an alert. The app is doing something anomalous. This role has never or has not recently made an S3 list buckets call. And so this is an opportunity for us as a security team to do what I talked about on the last slide, where we can, we've got that window, and we can do something about it and have a big impact on the company. So this is when we can loop in the IR team. We can affect a quarantine. We can do some digging. We have a lot of options, and the reason that we have it is because we know what normal behavior for the app is. We can see the deviation from that and then do something. So, that, so that's the point of what we're talking about here, and, and that's the, the approach that we're going to be uh, talking about. Now, in order to do this, you need to have some things be true, some simple building blocks. The first is CloudTrail. 
CloudTrail, I'm sure most of you are aware, is this really cool thing that tracks for a lot of AWS API calls what's happening. And this is important because that's how we know both what an application normally does and what it's doing currently. And CloudTrail is really large, so we don't need all of the, all of the log data that CloudTrail gives us. What we really need to know is who, the principal, is doing what and what it's doing it to. And the rest of the, the log data that we get is not, we don't need it for this approach. You may use things like IP addresses that can be useful in other contexts, but for the approach that we're talking about today, we really just need that who, what, and, and to what. And so what we want to do is get the cloud trail somewhere queryable, somewhere where we can take that massive log data and boil it down to just the things we want. In this talk, we're going to be, uh, Will's going to mention how we can do this with Athena, just directly querying the S3, log, uh, the S3 buckets where CloudTrail gets delivered. But you could also dump it in Elasticsearch. Uh, you could use Sumo Logic, like we do at Netflix. Uh, just somewhere queryable. We want one role per application or user. And the reason that we want this is because it makes it easy to tell what a specific app is doing. If you have applications, 5, 10, that are sharing a common role, then we really don't know what the, what the specific behavior for that app is. We know what the superset is for all the apps. And so this breaks our ability to do anomaly detection efficiently. You need an established burn-in period. So when an application spins up, everything's anomalous. It's never happened before. None of the things the application normally does have been observed. And the last thing that we would ever want is to be blowing up the security team or whoever's fielding these alerts with the entire application's anomalous. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a burn-in period. And this is just, uh, and Netflix is 90 days, but it could be whatever you think is normal. And we're just going to observe the application, but we're not going to send any alerts on it. And then after the burn-in period has expired, now we consider that we know what normal behavior is for the app, and we can start alerting when there's a deviation from that. We want roles consistently named across our accounts. And the reason for this is because it makes it really easy to correlate that behavior. If you have three accounts and you have the app Foo and it exists in all three accounts, you don't want to send three alerts. It would be nice if when you spin up Foo and test that that same behavior is considered normal for prod. So if you name roles consistently, it makes it much easier to tie all that behavior back together. Now, I will say that Doing this is going to incur more work. It would be so much easier to just bury your head in the sand, forget about all this anomaly detection, and not do anything. But you know, going back to the impact that we want to have, we're not going to get there if we're not paying attention to alerts. However, there's definitely going to be some false positives. Not everything that an app starts doing is bad. It's just new. Maybe it develops some new behavior. And so what I'd like to advocate is that you use this as an opportunity. When new behavior shows up, think about it for a minute and use this as an opportunity to extend your knowledge about the way that you think your uh, environment and account it works. Think about what is the most likely explanation here and, and then test it. Reach out to whoever owns the app and say, hi, I'm Travis. I'm on the security team. Calmly. We don't want to upset anybody. And say, I've noticed new behavior and I think it might be this and ask them about it. So this is a good way to meet people in your, in your org, people that you didn't know. Start building relationships. In the worst case, you learn something new, and you extend your knowledge about what's regular behavior. In the, in the best case, air quotes here, you've detected anomalous behavior, and you have the opportunity to do something. Some of you may be wondering, what about guard duty? Guard duty does anomaly detection. It can tell, for example, when an API is invoked from a Tor exit node or is uh, from a known malicious IP with its threat detection feeds. And most importantly for this talk, it does unusual or recon calls made by a principal. So the TLDR, guard duty is really cool. You should check it out. <clears throat> uh, but we still think that there's value in combining what we're talking about here, uh, maybe with guard duty or use, uh, use just this. Because guard duty, the way it works, is based on learning, and it's black box. You really don't have any visibility into what it's learning and why. And the approach that we're talking about here is completely white box. You can see everything that's going on. You can tune it according to your business logic. You can adjust things. 
And we're not doing any learning here. This is just strictly a feed of things that are new for an application. So you get the opportunity to decide what's normal or not. And now I'm going to hand it over to my friend Will, and he's going to talk about specifically how this works. Thanks, Travis. So before we go off and meet new engineers and learn a little bit more about how applications work, right, the triaging of the alerts that you might get when you put this in place, the work that Travis said you're going to have to do because it's not just magic, uh, let's deep dive a little bit into how this actually works and what to expect from the open source code today. So just a show of hands, who has seen a CloudTrail record before? It's quite a few. Anyone out there consider themselves an advanced CloudTrail investigator or user? A few. Anyone ever submit bugs or feature requests? Yeah, one person, sweet. Uh, awesome. So if you're not familiar with CloudTrail, uh, here's an example that's provided on the CloudTrail documentation website. It gives you a lot of valuable information, and Travis talked a little bit about what we're going to focus on here today. But a lot of this is important. We're going to lean into a couple of the fields here, not all of it, but much more than what we talk about here today can be useful. We've given talks in the past about how source IP could be used to detect compromise and things like that. But we're going to focus on a couple things here today. The first one is event name. And so event name is actually the API action that you're going to be calling. Uh, it's typically one-to-one -one call, so the SDK uh, function that you're actually making the, the call of is typically what is logged in CloudTrail. Every so often, that's not the case. So if you've investigated CloudTrail before, you might see the anomalies there. Uh, and most things from a control plane standpoint are being logged. As AWS has released more and more services, you can no longer do event name and just kind of understand what service you're talking to. So you might also want to look at event source, which is right above event name, typically in the CloudTrail log. So that's going to tell you which service you actually made that API action to, and so what uh, the, the APIs that you're actually trying to do, what, you, what you're trying to manipulate. Is it EC2? Is it S3? What is the application actually doing? Region might be something you want to look at as well. If your company is deploying a public-facing application, you typically probably have known regions that you operate in. At Netflix, they're a three-region company operating globally, or at least three. I left Netflix a little while ago, so it could have changed since. But you typically are deploying out of a, a region or two. So if you see something out of a different region, that might be something you want to pay attention to as well. In addition there, and one of the, I think, the most powerful pieces of CloudTrail is it's telling you who is making that call, as Travis mentioned earlier. So user identity is really important to pay attention to. And in our case here, we're going to dig into the principal ID. And principal ID here is actually going to be a globally unique identifier for your ARN or that IM role or user that's making the call. So the, the user identity here is going to tell you whether it's an IAM user, an IAM role. You can actually tell if AWS is making calls on your behalf using your credentials. It gives you a lot of information. And that principal ID is going to be really nice, because that's what we're going to track the event name and event source pairs to and see if there's any anomalies that come down the line. So if I have a, a role called Travis McPeak, it has a principal ID assigned to it. If you were to delete that role and then later create it, say, that day or a month from then, the principal ID assigned is going to be completely unique to the one that was before. So if you have an application using a role name that once existed, you have a completely new anomalous track, and you aren't going to be potentially colliding with old historical data that hasn't quite uh, TTL'd off the database state. Uh, so user identity, very powerful for us. Uh, one other thing that you might use that we're not going to focus here, but I wanted to mention it, is user agent. And so if you're an application, as, as an example, running Python, and you're talking to AWS, you might actually be using the Boto3 library. And so the user agent that you typically see is going to have Boto3 in the name. And so if you start seeing user agents that are AWS SDK Java, AWS-CLI, Kali Linux, that might be anomalous and something for you to pay attention to. It's also going to provide a lot of insight into how your application is being developed, because you can start seeing if you're seeing browser-based user agents as well. So are there pre-signed URLs? So a lot of other stuff that you can look into further or in the future after you go through this uh, anomaly detection. So as Travis mentioned, we as humans, it's very easy for us to depict 
where the anomalies are when taking a look at a picture. So if I were to ask you, is there an anomaly in this photo, you would all respond, yes. Now, if I were to ask you how many, you might instantly say there's, there's one. But if you look closer, there's actually two, and you could argue with me that there's three if you look at the, the blackbirds in the very back there of the image. But the white goose up front is the main anomaly that instantly jumps out at us. Right past that is a, a completely gray goose with an orange beak. And then if you look at the rest, there's a bunch of gray geese with black heads and gray beaks. And so if you consider this an account or an application, you could say that the gray geese are the normal calls that are being made over that burn-in period. And then the, the two new, the white goose and the gray goose, are the new calls that have been made since that period has passed. And so you can take this approach, and what, we didn't just get to this from day one, think, let's do this, it's going to work, it's going to be amazing. We iterated as we did this. So if you think of taking this vision of depicting anomalies from a picture, and you apply it to an AWS account, you can start thinking, what type of calls are new at an account level or across all of our accounts? And you can start getting some really cool information into what services are being used across our enterprise. After reInvent, this is where it's going to blow up because there's all the new services people are going to start using. But you get an idea of what your engineers and the, the people you work with are actually trying to do at your companies. You then can take this and branch it out and start applying it to two accounts, two applications, continue to scale this out across your organization, or perhaps you have multiple AWS organizations and you want to scale this out. But as I mentioned, this wasn't just an overnight thing. We've iterated across, and it's been very successful, at least during the time that I worked with Travis at Netflix. And the first thing we did was take a look at the first time we saw a call across all the accounts. Now, we admit this was something we put in place a long time ago as a way to actually know what is tracked in CloudTrail. So by keeping track of every call that we see in CloudTrail, we can get a master list created of all calls that at least that we're making at Netflix that are tracked. And that list was important because Travis wrote a tool called RepoKid, which takes permissions away from your IAM roles that you're not using. So this kind of list became very important to us. But what we didn't know is one day we'd walk into work and have a bug bounty submission where a set of credentials were able to be exposed, and the person that took the credentials, the researcher, made a call that we had never once made at Netflix before. Now, the person had permission to do this, so it wasn't a denied anomaly, but it was a call that we never had seen across all of our accounts at Netflix. And that was kind of the eureka moment for us, like, hey, this could actually work beyond building that list of all things that we know are tracked, and hey, this is what our engineers are trying to use now. And so that was kind of our first step to success in this straightforward anomaly detection approach. Once you get that, you can start wanting to dial into a single account. So as, as you go and you orchestrate and kind of architect how you want to segment your accounts from a blast radius perspective or different divisions of your business, you're not all going to have the same API calls across. So you might have a master list that you're tracking globally, but you want to track something uh, at, at an account level. Say you have a, a logging account that all you're doing is pushing security logs to. You're typically probably seeing just S3 actions. If you have data events, you're seeing gets, puts, those kind of things. But maybe you never run EC2 or anything in there. So if you start seeing EC2 in that account, it can be very useful to you to get that notification that, hey, something is different in this account that we've never seen before. So instead of tracking just globally, you can start narrowing it down at an account level and start getting some real power from this as well. So if you get the picture, it's pretty straightforward. All we're doing is keeping track of things that we've seen, understanding is it anomalous to the particular thing that we're focusing on, be it an account, an organization, and in this open source example today, the IAM role. So with an IAM role, you can keep track of just, hey, what are the IAM roles actually calling? I have Travis McPeak role. I'm going to track everything that it's made over its lifetime, just so I have an understanding of all the things that it's done. You can start to then say, OK, well, after that burn-in period of end days, let's start seeing how that application changes. And as Travis mentioned, it could be work, because the application could be changing, could be evolving, right? You could be adding new features, which requires a new service within AWS 
or a new API, API call for a given service. What's really powerful here, and what Travis mentioned, is that white box approach. You have control of setting the context for your quote unquote model and the machine learning that we're doing here. And you're able to set that burn-in period. And so you've limited your false positives down quite uh, to near zero, hopefully. I think the false positives that we've seen are uh, you didn't redeploy your application in the given burn-in period. So typical uh, Netflix, other really mature enterprises will say, hey, every 60, 90 days you must redeploy and pick up the new base AMI. And so you kind of pull this burn-in period based on that approach. And so you expect the first time you deploy an application, if there's some API call that's made on boot and never again through the lifetime of the instance, that if they've redeployed in that burn-in period, you would have seen those API calls and they don't just TTL off. So we keep track of every service action call pair for each role or principal ID here, and then we keep track of it for a, a TTL period of the 90-day mark. And we're gonna utilize DynamoDB here, I'll show you, and the, the TTL feature there so that we don't have to do more work and clean up our database ourselves. But it becomes very powerful. And then on top of that, you can then decide, do you want to look at first time called for that IAM role in a particular region? So once again, we're back to the, are we outside the scope of our primary regions? Or is this region acting differently? So you can use this as a security intelligence piece. Potentially, uh, a new region becomes quite uh, different acting than your primary region from the amount of calls perspective and things like that as well. But very powerful. And you can see here, we kind of just iterated over time to how we've seen it. The false positives that we've encountered are things like, and it goes back to Travis saying, important to have consistent naming of your accounts. Uh, we had a tool at Netflix called Security Monkey that would s scan your environment and understand what resources you had. It would describe them. If, as it saw new resources, it would describe those resources and then write the information to a database. So what happens if an account becomes less active and you don't create new resources in that account for a while? Well, then it's not making those describe calls. And so the next time you make a new uh, resource in that account, Security Monkey would then go make those describe calls. If it's outside that burn-in period, it would be considered anomalous. But if we start tracking and have some enrichment after the fact and say, hey, this is actually Security Monkey, and in these other accounts we've seen this call, then we can say that's you know, normal action and not actually set that up to the IR team or whoever's still in those alerts. So you can start thinking, uh, are the, is the anomaly that we detect, can we, can we take a global look at it and make, make it not actually have to surface to a user to fill that as well? Uh, so some important things to think about beyond what Travis has mentioned. You want to have an, an accurate list of the AWS accounts. Because the way this approach that we're doing here is we're, we're requiring your AWS account list and role list to make this happen. We're not just going to query CloudTrail and getting an understanding of what roles exist, although you could take that approach. With this approach, we're, we're scanning account by account, role by role, and querying CloudTrail to see the anomalies. One role per service principle is important as well. As Travis mentioned, you want to have one role per application. Even though your application might have many different stacks in it, it's very important that you probably have a role that is dedicated to EC2 and you're not running in Lambda as well, because quite possibly the, the functions of those roles are quite different. So ensuring that your IAM role is only assigned to a service principle, a single service principle is important. You don't want your EC2 role to also be the role that is doing cross-region S3 bucket replication for you, because those are very different job functions. One role per app per region might be something that you want to do as well. On top of making anomaly detection per region much easier, because you don't have to track region at that point, it can also lead you to some robustness in approaches with uh, repoing, for example. You can uh, affect one role at a region, or a role at a region level instead of globally like IAM is now by default. So that might be something you want to consider. Consistent role naming is really important as well. Because although we can have these source systems and do enrichment, the first time that alert comes across, it might be interesting to know that by the name of the role that, hey, this is scoped to an EC2 instance. So you might end a role name with instance profile to dictate that this was actually assigned to an EC2 instance. 
if the role's on Lambda, you might also put Lambda profile at the end. You know, some sort of name designation so you don't have to do further enrichment to know kind of the threat landscape of what we're dealing with here. As you do cross-account access, maybe you want to name a role minion role or something like that so you, that you know that this role is actually being acted on by an application in an, another account. On top of that, as Travis mentioned, you can then dig towards resources. So we know anomaly detection based on uh, service action, but do we know which S3 buckets we're potentially targeting or talking to? So if I typically only talk to three S3 buckets and all of a sudden I talk to four, or I'm talking to an S3 bucket that's not owned by my company, then maybe that's anomalous as well. So once you get this action pairing anomaly detection, taking it one step further and looking at the resources tied to those principal IDs can be very, very powerful. But once again, as your application expands scope or adapts a new library and wants to talk to a new S3 bucket, this is where you're gonna have to put in some automation and enrichment to help remediate and eliminate those false positives for you. If not, you're gonna be making a lot of friends at your company. Uh, and lastly, CloudTrail just released a new uh, feature called CloudTrail Insights. So while we're focusing here on the action level calls being anomalous, CloudTrail Insights is gonna focus on the volume of those calls. So if your application's actually doing things like launching instances, say you only usually launch, launch 10 instances an hour and all of a sudden you launched 100, that could be indicative of a flaw in code. So hey, we need to roll that change back or perhaps you have uh, a crypto miner spinning up, uh, but it's something to you know, tie in as well along with the guard duty that Travis mentioned. So if you look at the architecture of this, it's pretty simple. You have the CloudTrail anomaly detection right there off center right. We're going to be centralizing all CloudTrail to a single S3 bucket, utilizing Amazon Athena to do the querying to select the distinct actions for that role in the given period that we decide. We're gonna write those to Amazon DynamoDB. We're gonna use the TTL feature within Amazon to keep that burn-in period for us and automatically delete entries that are beyond that period. And those entries that get deleted are gonna be the anomalous calls that we see if they make those again. And then we're gonna to alert to SNS, and from SNS you can go and subscribe to a queue or do whatever you want there. And so if we're gonna dig into what code would look like, we could pseudocode on the, on the wall and we could take a list of accounts. And so in the open source code that we provide here today, you can either provide a common delimited list of accounts via the CLI, or the uh, software will actually go into your organization account and list accounts there. We're then going to loop account by account and assume role into each account and get a list of all of your roles. And then for each role, we're gonna go ahead and make that query into Athena and say, hey, give, hey, Athena, give me the unique calls for this principle for the last, say, 60 minutes. We're gonna take that pairing, and then we're going to loop through each call, check to see if we actually have it in the Dynamo table. If we don't have it in the Dynamo table, then we're going to write it to the Dynamo table, set a TTL of that burn-in period that we've defined. We're gonna check to see if that role has been created within the burn-in period. If it's too new, we don't wanna alert, as Travis said, we don't wanna say, every new call is anom anomalous. And if it's not too new, then we're gonna alert. Else, if the call's already there, we're gonna update that TTL to that burn-in period so that the call stays in the, in the Dynamo table for us, and then we're gonna move on. And that's it, account by account, roll by roll, straightforward logic. And with that, this is the link for the open source that we're providing today. Uh, I personally would love feedback uh, if anyone actually uses this and finds it helpful. Uh, but with that, I think we're done and open to questions. Is that right? But thank you all for coming. <laughs>